Hello again my friends, it is KSP Russia here <clears throat> and I'm back with another very exciting adventure to share with you today. Many of you enjoyed my recreation of the now infamous Soviet N1 moon rocket, but you may not be aware of the other Soviet moon rocket. I mean, it was never built, but it was the one of the main competitors for the N1 program. I mentioned in the N1 moon rocket video that the designers very much took the Kerbal approach with this design and just kept on adding more and more engines until it worked. However, this here, the UR700, the UR standing for Universal Rocket, cranks the Kerbal Factor up to 11, and then beyond some more. Obviously, I'm, I'm still building it at this point, but in time, uh, it'll become quite obvious. When we get to uh, constructing the lower stages of the rocket, you'll see that it's, uh, well, it's, uh, it's a real mess when it comes to stages and boosters and fuel lines. It would look very much at home on Kerbin. <laughs> The reason for its apparent complexity is because its designer, uh, I'm gonna get this wrong, Vladimir Chelomi? That's how it's- I'm just reading it how my English brain would pronounce it, but I'm sure it's got a different pronunciation in Russia. Um, he had this vision that we'd have one- there'd be like one rocket with lots of interchangeable parts that could be, uh, mixed and matched depending on the, uh, the objective. And that's why it's called the Universal Rocket. So that's why this one here is covered in different boosters and side things and all that, because it was all using the same kind of core. But unfortunately, it never really, it never really got off the ground, pun intended there. But uh, the legacy of the UR program is the Proton Rocket. That's kind of where, that's kind of the legacy of the Universal Rocket program. So, other than looking utterly ludicrous compared to it, how else does this thing differ to the N1? Well, the main thing, and the reason why I wanted to showcase it today is because this would, be a, this would have been a direct ascent launch profile. And by direct ascent, I mean there's no docking involved. The whole ship goes to the moon, the whole ship lands on the moon, and then the whole ship comes back. There's no rendezvous in lunar orbit or orbital reconfiguration of the vessel or anything like that. So it's a far more simple process, but it demands a much more powerful rocket, hence why it's never really been done in the real world. Well, it's never been done. <laughs> in the real world. Chelemy felt that the uh, the lunar orbit rendezvous approach of the of Korolev's N1 system compromised crew safety to an unacceptable degree, apparently. Um, he argued that the features of his design would be uh, simple and more reliable because it's a direct landing scheme. Um, doesn't require any dockings, obviously. All stages use the same storable propellant. So he makes a point that it is far simpler and, you know, suddenly as players of KSP, I think we can all appreciate that direct ascent missions are generally much, much easier than a Apollo style, at least when it comes to things like the Man and Minmus, uh, even Tylo, it's pretty hard to do direct ascent, but I think those are completely different beasts entirely when comparing them to Kerbin's Mun. Uh, I think we can all appreciate the simplicity of direct ascent and how we all tend to do that before we then subsequently go on to learn how to do rendezvous. Well, I mean, I say it's a simple approach just by the nature of direct ascent, but I'm sure you can appreciate now, looking at the construction of this thing, how it's sort of becoming this massive bloated mess that it's certainly not simple in the rocket itself. We got these... I wasn't really sure how to construct the shape of these boosters, so I kind of had to build them onto like a girder section, then duplicate it around. I think I got the shape pretty good. The, uh... The bit that go, the bit underneath the main fairing is not quite accurate to the shape of the real rocket, but I thought it looked a bit clunky and cumbersome because <laughs> the rest of the rocket looks fine. But I couldn't quite get the shape to look quite right doing it uh, quote unquote accurately, so I just went with that adapter fuel tank and just put the fairing around it. And as you can see, we're adding some fuel lines here because this ship would have actually used onion style staging, which is like asparagus, where all the peripheral tanks feed into the central tank whilst all engines burn, so that when the first stage detaches, stage two is still full of fuel. That's what the uh, Falcon Heavy was going to use actually, but in the end it was just deemed too complicated. And there she is, on the launch pad, ready to go. Um, you may notice those strange fins I've put near the bottom, those are meant to be grid fins, but obviously they don't, they don't exist in stock KSP, and a lot of Soviet rockets used grid fins rather than conventional fins, because they kind of perform better at high speeds, hence why Falcon 9 uses it, but look at that for a cinematic takeoff as we soar into the blue. Now, uh, I've had to... Obviously this rocket is far too powerful, really, for a standard KSP mission, so a lot of the tanks aren't fully fueled, and a lot of the tanks are actually disabled as well to kind of add a little bit of extra weight, just so this thing isn't ridiculously overpowered for what it needs to be. But I've put the uh, little diagrams of the real stages uh, throughout this video so you can kind of get a comparison of what this thing looks like compared to the real-life counterpart, or at least the theorised counterpart. And there goes a beautiful cross separation there of the first stage, and as you can see, stage two theoretically would be full of fuel, but as I said, I've disabled some of the tanks, so we technically only have just over a third of our fuel left. And we have those hydraulic decouplers firing off just there. 
They were there for reasons that you'll understand later, my friends. But yeah, now we're going to go is basically just coast our way through the upper atmosphere with stage two, and then we'll complete uh, the process of raising our apoapsis with stage three, which actually the engines weren't that powerful. I probably should use more powerful engines here because I still have a lot of fuel left over. I probably should have spent a little bit more time balancing this craft out, but I mainly went with aesthetics first, then think about the logistics later. So we had to spend quite a lot of time burning at 45 degrees relative to the surface because the TWR of this stage is so bad. Uh, but there goes the main fairing. Now we're nice and high out of the atmosphere. We're not going to be having too much drag at this point. So we can shed the excess weight and there goes the launch escape system as well. I don't know if you can see it there, but that's why I had the extra hydraulic decouplers because you can see those kind of black lines that go over the engines. The very bottom one was the decoupler for stage one and they were just kind of floating there. So I added two more hydraulic decouplers above it just so it looked like it was still connected to the ship and didn't look like it was just floating uh, independently of the vessel. And so our apoapsis is now clear of the atmosphere atmospheric line we're just going to carry on coasting pointing prograde until we've depleted all the fuel in this stage there's an example of an empty tank by the way to add some weight to this ship uh, and then we're going to fire up the next stage so at this point it's not quite clear exactly the configuration of how this mission would have gone the great thing about recreating missions that never happened and will never happen is that you can pretty much take any liberties you want because it's all very ambiguous anyway but this is stage four anyway I went with those engines there just because they kind of look similar to the ones on the diagrams, not because they're very appropriate for this sort of stage in the rocket. These engines here are very much optimised for functioning in the lower atmosphere, hence their very small uh, nozzle diameter. It means they're more optimised for lower, lower atmospheric flight. But again, this rocket was very over-engineered. I needed as many ways to uh, reduce its efficiency as I could to uh, make it kind of not completely overkill for a MUN mission. So stage four is well underway at this point. I'm just creating a maneuver node to get our MUN encounter. I didn't bother trying to get a free return or anything fancy because technically they never specified it had to be a free return trajectory in the UR700 files, at least that I could see in my brief Googling. And I checked the second page of Google, so you know I was thorough. Uh, I didn't say anything about free return, so eh, we'll just go for a standard. We'll go for a standard MUN encounter, nothing special. In fact, we're going to go for a MUN collision because after we've completed this uh, in uh, transfer burn, we're going to eject stage four. And I've put fuel lines as well, so these three peripheral tanks are feeding into the central one, although I don't actually know if that was the plan, but given that that's what they did for the lower stages, I assumed that's what would have happened for this one. So stage four is designed for transferring to Muna space, and then we'll uh, do the actual braking using stage five. The first thing we need to do with stage five, however, is to make sure that we don't hit the MUN either. So stage four will be detached so it won't be left in space. It will crash into the Muna surface and then we'll do a quick retrograde burn uh, with stage five. Uh, there's a little diagram there and uh, get our, well, get a get a periapsis for the MUN, not just raise periapsis. There we go. So a little bit too high for my liking. I would have liked a little bit lower than that, but I was a bit overzealous with the burn. Again, these engines are very powerful. They're designed to lift the first stage or the second stage of spacecraft from the surface of Kerbin. So for vacuum flight, they are somewhat to overkill, but as I said, overkill is the name of the game. Now you can see the kind of the weird landing legs on this thing. The reason for this is this is the LK700 lander. So you've got the UR700 rocket, the LK700 lander. And uh, the landing legs are kind of these very, it's a very broad, flat base. I'll sh there'll be a diagram of the stage when, it, when the time comes. And I tried to mimic that as much as I could. I initially tried air brakes and uh, airplane landing gear, but I didn't really like the way those looked. So I kind of just went with this offset standard landing gear to make a nice wide platform for the lander. So we're just going to lower the height of our orbit a little bit more before we select a landing site. I didn't really have any plans for a specific landing site, so I thought I'd just have a little have a little ganders at the map screen and see if there's anything that looked interesting. I thought that crater might be a good candidate there, so uh, there we go. Just raising our eyes just to the edge of the border of it because we'll continue to move that uh, orbital trajectory as we decelerate and obviously the MUN's going to rotate as well. So uh, here's a little top tip. I don't give many tips in my Kerbal Space Program videos these days, but what we're going to do, we're going to add a maneuver node here and we're going to drag the retrograde marker to essentially bring our velocity to zero. Now this, this does require Kerbal Engineer, but if you look at the estimated burn time, you can see it says 53 seconds, requiring 556.7 meters per second, which is more than the delta V of this stage. We can't do our entire burn using this stage, but if we look at our impact time, you can see it's about 1 minute 28. So as long as you start burning before the uh, before 53 seconds, you should be fine. Well, I mean, it wouldn't be fine in this case because we'd end up hitting the surface because we'd run out of fuel. But I use that as kind of an approximation of how long it would take to stop this thing when it came to landing it. It's great if you want to do a suicide burn. 
Anyway, we're going to spend the last of our fuel in this stage and detach that engine. One of the theorized engines for the UR700 was a nuclear engine, so I wasn't sure if I was going to do a nuclear stage or not. But uh, in the end, I decided to go for conventional rockets because it looked like it was more than likely the f at least the first few UR700s would have been conventional rockets. And there goes stage six. You can see on that diagram those very, very large landing legs. I couldn't quite get the same di diameter on this one, but I think I got pretty close. So it's going to gradually coast our way down to zero. The landing skis, um, they were designed for a tolerance of less than five meters per second on impact. So we're going to go and try and go nice and slowly and make sure we're under that velocity. And we are. And now we are pretty much touched down. So do a little cinematic pan around and deploy the ladders, which I've got bound to an action group. Action group zero, or action group nine, I don't know. And then we can get our three Kerbals on EVA, because this was another thing that wasn't quite clear uh, in the UR700 documents. The plan was, that I think initially, the first few flights would only be two cosmonauts, but then after that, they might upgrade that to three cosmonauts, or like two cosmonauts and a rover. And there goes the flag there, so... This was a great achievement for the Soviets. There we are. <laughs> Memes aside, we can plant our flag and a little caption there and get our other Kerbals on board because you may have noticed that we have a compartment bay, like a, what are they called? Service modules? I can't remember what they're called in this game. I think they're called service modules, aren't they? <laughs> we have some science things in there because as usual, we're playing this in my sandbox save, which means that I have all my science points. We can, un well, we can unlock science points. So we may as well do some experiments whilst we're here. And because we have capacity for three Kerbals, that meant that we could bring Bob Kerman along with us, who is a scientist and he can therefore do the science experiments on EVA. I guess this is a bit of a redundant thing because the pilots can do it as well and there's no need to reset the experiments in this case so we didn't really need a scientist with us but whatever and this is Bob showing us how to uh, how to safely extract science from experiments just you want to lie with your head precariously hanging out of the service base if there was any doubt this is now you know how to correctly do it and now we have the science back so we can close that service bay in a second and get the Kerbals back on board the ship ready to return to Kerbin. Now in terms of the return stage, stage 7, we're going to be using the same, we're going to be using the same engine we used to land. I couldn't figure out from all the diagrams whether or not the landing stage used a separate engine like the Apollo style missions were or if it used its, the, the same engine like the proposed N1 missions would have done. In the end I went with what the N1 would have been where we used the same engine to land and take off. So we're just going to detach ourselves from the base and fly ourselves back to Kerbin. So I just got disabled the engine with an action group, then fired them up at the same time so we can get a nice clean separation. There we go. And I met. Well, I, I spent a while getting it so that base would remain intact as we took off. You can, might have seen in the construction process that to kind of painstakingly construct it all around one decoupler. But there we are, stage seven. So yeah, you know, I think I think as far as stages go, this was pretty accurate to the real thing because it's probably the easiest shape to replicate, you know, compared to the insanity that is the rest of the rocket. So we're not going to do anything fancy, really. Just going to burn prograde and wait for our apoapsis to raise to a suitable height, really. One bit of admin I could cover during this type, this time when not much is really happening, is that there is a music video version to this mission in the description that is very serious and is a very, it's a very serious documentary style music video. So if you want to watch a serious non-me music video. There is a link in the description, and uh, there'll be some links on screen as well to other things. And look at that for a, a beautiful blue marble uh, Kerbin rise there as we accept it. In fact, I was so mesmerized, I, I stopped paying attention to the Kerbal Engineer readouts, and we massively overshot. So I just did some quick uh, radial burns to bring our payouts in, as has, the as has been the case for the, most, for the rest of this mission. Uh, everything's been very overkill. We have way too much Delta V for every single stage, so it wasn't. I uh, wasn't really worried about wasting fuel or anything with that inefficient maneuver. So we're just going to say goodbye to the Mun, and we never really need to fire that engine again. We have a nice low periapsis, so we're going to be doing a quick aero break before landing. So all we're going to do now is detach our uh, upper and lower stages, which are going to go now, or are they going to go now? There we go. And there we are. I don't know why I felt it so necessary to document exactly what it happened, because you think you would think the video would document it quite well. Serious stage eight. Uh, not a lot to it really, just a heat shield and a capsule and some parachutes. Very easy to forget those. Although interestingly, the uh, the first Soviet space missions didn't have parachutes on the landers, or at least the cosmonauts weren't expected to land on the surface in the lander. They would have to bail from the capsule and parachute down themselves. And I guess Kerbals now have that ability as well. So it wouldn't have been a disaster if I'd forgotten the parachutes. But I'm sure Jebediah, Bob and Bill are thankful that I did remember to put parachutes on. 
But yeah, that's the UR700. Probably that, you know, that one time Soviet Russia went full Kerbal. Although, there was a proposed design for UR900, which is even bigger. So maybe I might revisit that, depending on what you guys thought of this video. Is that something you might like to see? Don't know. Next week will be Green Harvest. Yeah, get hyped. So, uh, yeah, link's on screen. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to put on the screen. Maybe I'll put on the left uh, a Direct Ascent Eve mission, so you can see how Direct Ascent can be quite difficult. And maybe on the right can be a Tylo Direct Ascent. 